Today, I want to talk about the four teams that would make the college football playoff right now, today, based on the SP+. And all that's coming up after the bumper. Don't be cornering me. Hold up. Time. You gotta help me with that, that corner sh**. <laughs> What's up again, folks? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Consider hitting the like and subscribe button because I upload a video every single day. It's always college football related, sports related. We have a good time. Excuse me. Sorry. Couldn't do much about that. That was coming. It was out. Glad we got it behind us. I'm also a little bit under the weather. It's like zero degrees, literally, in Tulsa, where I live. Snow on the ground. I hate it. But based on Bill Conley's SP Plus rankings following National Signing Day, the four teams that would make the college football playoff are as follows, right? These are the four teams that are best in the SP Plus, which is a great predictor of how college football teams will perform. Sometimes it doesn't go that way. That's why we play the games. But today, we got Ohio State at number four, Oklahoma at number three, Clemson at number two, Alabama at number one. Two of those three teams basically have returning starting quarterbacks, really only one if we're going to use the metric of having started more than half the season. That'd be Spencer Rattler, right, coming out of Oklahoma, which returns a ton. And then when you look at SP Plus and the rankings, make sure I put my glasses on because this is in front of me. Yes, I'm right. Oklahoma is number one in offensive SP Plus at 46.6. And then at number two is Ohio State, number four, Alabama, number nine, Clemson. Then defensively, Oklahoma's at 16 and Ohio State's at 38. Like, that's a drastic difference and not necessarily the way that you would expect it to go unless you watched a lot of Ohio State and a lot of Oklahoma football like I did last year. Oklahoma's defense got better as the year kept going on, looking demonstrably better against Florida in the Cotton Bowl than it did against, say, Kansas State, Iowa State, September, October. Then taking a look at Clemson, they got DJ Uwe Ungalale coming back. Maybe Justin Ross, if he gets cleared to play, let's act as if he will. So that's a pretty good tandem that you have. DJ obviously went for 439, two TDs against Notre Dame, number one team in the country at the time. Or excuse me, number no, no, Clemson was the number one team in the country at the time, and that was Notre Dame getting the win in South Bend against Clemson, one that they desperately needed to prove that they were about it. They end up getting that. Also ran four spot in the college football playoff because that's what it's getting to be like. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Alabama has Bryce Young, but it also loses a ton. It loses Devontae Smith. It loses Jalen Waddell. It loses Leather, uh, Alex Leatherwood at offensive tackle. Landon Dickerson at, yes, of course, center. And then Deontay Brown or, uh, at, my goodness, left guard, right guard, guard. Obviously, Mac Jones and Najee Harris. So you're replacing a lot, but... Because of Alabama's recruiting, because they've been able to plug and play in a way that many teams have not, we're always going to count Alabama as in it. New offensive coordinator, new offensive line coach, new special teams coordinator, new running back coach, new defensive back coach. Almost everything is brand new at Alabama because that's what happens when you win a national championship. Traditionally, you get poached. Clemson has been remarkable at holding on to its offensive and defensive coordinators for longer. And also going into that, their position coaches. And we've seen a little bit of moving and shaking. Danny Perriman moves to an off-the-field coaching responsibility. C.J. Spiller moves up to running backs coach. <laughs> That's how old I'm getting. I remember C.J. Spiller being the man in 2007. Ohio State is the only one of these where we actually have a quarterback derby. I'm assuming that Bryce Young has won the job over Bear Bryant's grandson, Paul Tyson. And I don't expect for Jalen Milrow to come in right away and compete for that job. Expect him a red shirt. So let's assume Bryce Young, D.J. Uwe Ungalale, and Spencer Rattler, your starting quarterbacks. Ohio State, C.J. Stroud, Jack Miller, Kyle McCord. There'll be a three-way derby for that. Two four-stars and a five-star. You're going to be fine offensively. We know about what they have in weapons at Ohio State. What we don't know is how good the defense is going to be in Kerry Combs' this year, too. Safe to say Jeff, Le Jeff Hathley has been the best defensive coordinator at Ohio State probably since Chris Ash in 2014 when they won a national championship. Halfley also got that defense figured out in a way where they could run single high safety. They could run eight in the box. They could really clamp down on defenses because they had outstanding corner and safety play. They didn't have that last year, and it showed. This year, we'll see what that looks like, especially with them returning Josh Proctor at that free safety position. You get Tyreek Smith back. You get Zach Harrison back. You lose Tommy Togi and Jonathan Cooper off that defensive line, but you got Haskell Garrett back, right? You got Antoine coming back. To say nothing of four-star linebackers when you're replacing really all of those guys. Justin Hilliard, Pete Werner, Tuff Borland, and Baron Browning. Yeah, 
you're going to have some moving and shaking at the linebacker spot, but I expect them to run two instead of three most of the time, and I rarely, if ever, will see them with four. Yes, you lose Sean Wade, but I think you're going to be okay at corner. That's one of the things that Ohio State has hung its hat on is being able to produce corners. I think the dark horse out of uh, the SP Plus as we go through the top 25 in there, for me, is actually Washington. The reason I say Washington is because when we go down the SP Plus, let me just go through it. Alabama, Clemson, Oklahoma, Ohio State, know about them. Oregon won a Pac-12 championship there at number five. Georgia, they ought to be there at the end. They're not going to sneak up on anybody. Iowa State was in the Big 12 championship, won its first major bowl in the Fiesta Bowl, boat racing Oregon. We know about them. Miami was good against everybody but Clemson and North Carolina. That's all dependent on Derek King being healthy, but they add guys like Charleston Rambo. They ought to be able to compete. Wisconsin is not necessarily a dark horse to me. We didn't get to really see a whole lot of Wisconsin playing football, especially with their first team. Graham Mertz is now the guy with Jack Cohen deciding to transfer to Notre Dame. Jalen Berger is going to have to take over that bell cow back role in a way that he didn't last year. You've seen such good tailback play come out of Wisconsin the past 20 years. It's hard to believe that Jalen Berger would not be that guy. And then there's North Carolina. Sam Howell loses De'Ami Brown, loses Daz Newsom, loses Chad Surratt on defense, and loses both tailbacks and Javante Williams and Michael Carter on offense. Sam Howell's going to have to do a lot of work. And then Washington at number 11. Washington is sneaky good to me because I believe that Sam Heward is going to beat out Dylan Morris for the starting job at Washington. If not, by the time they open the season in the big house against Michigan, then later on down the road, Jimmy Lake and that defense are going to have to take over in a way that I don't think that they've had to in years past. That said, you got to go back five years before Washington's given up more than 35 points in a game. They are a ball control, play defense kind of program. They're the northern version of Utah. Utah is the southern version of Washington, and I'm bullish on them as well. They're all the way down there at 19, though. We don't know what they got in the quarterback. We know that somebody out there is talented enough to play that quarterback position for them. We just don't know which one of those guys is going to be. Texas A&M coming in at number 13 behind Florida. I did not expect. Florida lost a lot. Trayvon Grimes along with Kyle Pitts, of course, Kyle Trask. There's a ton, but they also have a ton coming in, if not through the transfer portal, then in recruiting. That would be able to plug and play. Their only weakness is still their defensive coordinator and Ty Grantham. I just don't trust that dude to do anything but blitz people. And then as you go down through toward the top 25, you get to... Notre Dame at 25, which means that they're going to fall precipitously. They could be in, in the Camping World Bowl once again, but they're not going to get back to the college football playoff, right? The, we, we all get that. Louisiana's ranked at 20 in here. UCLA's at 21. Those are teams on their way back up. Now, as we're talking about this, one of the other things that I wanted to bring up is the AFCA basically came to something like majority in that they want to see the playoff expanded from four teams. Nick Saban spoke about this a little bit on Rich Eisen's show when he said, look, what happened when we were just picking two teams to play for a national championship and everybody wanted to go to a playoff is what we're getting now, which is you got more people that are saying not enough teams get in, and that's true. So we're going to keep expanding the playoff, in which case he's worried that the Bulls don't matter. Well, the Bulls don't matter anyway. Nobody's watching the RoofClaim.com Boca Raton Bowl except football degenerates like me, BYU fans, and Central Florida fans. That ain't exactly going to be a pull for anybody. Same thing with the Music City Bowl or the Tax Slayer Bowl or any of the other bowls that happen before December 31st. I think there's a way for you to incorporate the bowls into an expanded playoff, but that would mean that they're just bowl games in name only. And for somebody, that's going to be the last game they play that season, so it works either way for me. Expand the playoff, you cowards, right? We're past talking about this. As Saban said, I started talking about it like, well, he didn't say anything about me. I started talking about it four or five years ago because I was like, yo, man, Cincinnati's got to get an opportunity to get their butt kicked. You got to let them in this thing. Well, we know that Cincinnati's going to lose, except for the one time that they don't, right? I believe that you should have an opportunity to play until somebody beats you. That way you get one definitive national champion. We don't have to have NCAA designated selectors, of which I think there are 15. And some of those are just opinion polls. I talked with a prominent college football name here recently, and one of the things that he had said about the college game is the commentator's opinions matter. Writer's opinions matter. It's the only sport where it does. I don't. Yeah, he thought that was a good thing because it meant that his opinion meant something to people. And I'm going, nah, man. Your opinion is good as anybody else's. Now, whether or not it's informed is something else entirely. 
right? And that's one of the reasons we differentiate folks that cover the sport from folks that don't. You're probably better informed if you cover it. There are people that are avid fans that are better informed than some sports media people. You know that. You understand that. But I believe that the decider of who should play for national championships should happen on a football field and be designated by a scoreboard, not by a bunch of suits in the Gaylord Texan in Texas. I just don't see it that way. All right. That's it for me. Deuces.